notice how we often put photos of loved ones on our desk, regardless of whether our desk is at home or in an office? We do so to remind ourselves of what is important to us in life. Let's take it further. Ever notice how plants and paintings soften a space, not just aesthetically, but also improve the air and energy in that room? Even how we place furniture has an impact on our perspective and how we feel. Good design is deliberate. It not only shapes a space to be aesthetically pleasing, it sees a space for its ability to affect our health and well-being. And today, we need that more than ever. With mental ill health on the rise and a sense of feeling disconnected to others becoming more prevalent, the spaces we occupy can help bridge the gap between existing and thriving. And that is where Paolo De Simone, design director and well-accredited professional, comes in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast. I'm Monita Rajpal. In this series, we are taking a different look at the incredible talent at WATG, one where we get to know them on a personal level. After all, it is their interests, where they came from, what choices they made growing up that shapes who they have become today and how they bring their most authentic self to work every day. Paolo De Simone is passionate about how design can affect our health and wellness. As a well-accredited professional, his job is to ensure that every aspect of a design project meets the standards that affect our health, mental and physical, in a positive way. Growing up in a small town outside Naples, in a close-knit family, it shaped his view of the world, one that was filled with an appreciation for art, for culture, for history, and for how it all leads to an important ingredient in life, and that is connection to others and to ourselves. Paolo joins me from Singapore. Paolo, welcome. Thank you, Monita. I am super intrigued to talk to you about what it is you do. You are a well-accredited professional. What does that mean? Yeah, um, it starts with uh, something that I've always been very interested to look at is the sustainability uh, aspect of our work as an interior designer. There was this mission in our company right now is to get used to and to discover even more what that sustainability uh, means specifically for from the design point of view. So there was few accreditations globally and the well certification accreditation was something that I always thought it was more related to the interior design. So it, it was really uh, refreshing in a way because I, mm. I started to be to come back to the school in a way to study. And actually, uh, the pandemic helped me a lot because we were spending a lot of time at home. Not because I was boring, but you have a lot of time that you can, you can spend on something else except for work. So I, it was really uh, something that I wanted to, to do. Uh, well, well, accreditation is a, a program that is uh, basically studying the human behavior specifically inside the building. So it's something that it starts from definitely from, from the inside, mm. from the interior point of view, how things are affecting the behavior of the users, the customer, the lighting, how the, the people feel about using type of furniture or the ergonomics, a lot of aspects kind of very in detail, some technical aspect as well. I had to study and refresh my memories from the university. So it was a really a great opportunity to go more in deep on how interior design can affect as well all the users or the customers. Is it related to, obviously, when you say we go deep, is it, is it about health and, and mental health and wellness and in that sense? Yes, definitely. That's why well probably mm. is the main the statement of the accreditation is uh, definitely taking care about the human uh, body as well, the reaction, the health. There are aspects there in regards to the mind, uh, to the body, to, to how uh, people react to certain moments of the day, how, how mm. that aspect influences your, your day life, which definitely we are so focused on working that sometimes we, we forget about it. <laughs> 
It's so true, isn't it? It's so true in the sense that because we are spending so much more time at home and it's becoming a dual use space or multi-use space, while we often think of soft furnishings as a way to bring us comfort or comfortable chairs for uh, onto which we sit, whether it is at our desk or at a dining table, there are so many other aspects for our mental health and physical health that are design specific. How would you say a healthy space is defined? What does it look and feel like? Well, the healthy space to me is, is something that definitely has a, a good interaction with the, the people that they are using it. So uh, your body, so the ergonomics of your chair is, is extremely important. The comfort that you are giving to the that design. Uh, and, and an important aspect, I believe, was the biophilia, mm-hmm. uh, the sense of uh, having uh, something that is it's also just a window outside that shows like part of your landscape. Maybe it's not that great, but the, what are you seeing from the window? But it's something that can definitely improve your health. Also, the way that you have to incorporate the green inside the spaces, which is not just surrounded by plants, but something that's also an artwork, for example, piece of art. It can give something that makes you feel very comfortable, very pleased. Is there a sense that we kind of moved away from this for a period of time? Because it is my understanding, and and do correct me if I'm wrong, modern architecture or modernism was built upon this idea of health and wellness, right? It was during the time of the, I think it was the early 20th century, where there was the epidemic of tuberculosis, and there was a lot of emphasis placed on how we live in spaces. Back in back in the day, it was very heavy fabrics, woods, everything that was, and carpets and things like that. Whereas when modernism then was born, it was all about these clean lines and healthy living space. I, I remember reading an article or an interview with the professor of the history of architecture at Princeton University, um, Her name is Beatrice Colomina. And she said, modern architecture has more to do with the campaign for health than with anything else. In fact, many of the ideas that modern architects were proposing didn't come from architectural theory. They came from doctors, nurses, and hospital architecture, particularly tuberculosis sanatoriums. Is there a sense that we moved away from this for a period of time? To me, that was something that was at the basic of the thinking of how the architecture interact with the users first, but also with the environment outside. So I, I still remember some of those architecture that they started to open those uh, large windows that shows that interaction between the inside outside. And so people they, that they are using that, that architecture, that building, they feel very connected to, to the nature uh, of, the, of the area that they are uh, placed. Uh, so I, I believe that there is a, a strong, I, rem, I still remember from my university time that we talk about green architecture. And nowadays we are still thinking, we are still talking about it even, even more. So it, I, I think it's, it's great that uh, we still, we still able to talk about it. We, we see a lot of improvement around us, in particular as an interior designer, we face every day with new materials sustainable materials and how that are implemented in our design. Now is the focus definitely is more towards having a very strong green approach. It's a multifaceted approach, isn't it? It's about yes, the, the materials yeah. as sustainable materials, but also how it impacts all of us. There are a lot of conversations that are taking place about it. There's a difference between talking about it and doing. Talk to yeah. me about how you are actively doing and the projects that you've worked yeah. on that, that really address and focus on wellness, if you will. Yeah, I'm fortunate that the type of project that they are working on are always uh, in the hospitality environment. So that's a great opportunity for us to even explore a different way to, to address those topics. What I feel really interested in is always and I've always been interested from, from my uh, university time, 
is how people react to spaces. It's not about functionality anymore to me, which is the, the base of a good design, but it's also how those spaces are triggering inner feelings, emotions, and how they make you feel very well. That's something that I want to always apply to my design in general, as a principle, if I can say it. Even if it's just an artwork or it's just an object, I, I'm more interested into the guest experience in a way how they feel and not just uh, following some trends or some color palette. I'm more interested to, to deliver a good quality of work and design. What is it, do you think, then, we are looking for more and more in terms of feeling and emotions when we do go into a, a hospitality space, a hotel, a resort, a restaurant, anything? What is it are you noticing that we are looking to feel? Okay, there is kind of a contradicting aspect to what is right now and social media are full of those Instagrammable moments, specifically in our design. So I, I tend to go more deeper. I prefer to tell a story, something that someone who is uh, listening to the story can relate to or can easily remember when, when he will, will go away from, from the, the place they are, they are visiting. So I tend to be very focused on designing something memorable, but not Instagrammable, <laughs> if you can pass me this, this term. I know we are everywhere. We are full of uh, people that they are they're just going to plays. They want to show off. Uh, there. Uh, <laughs> I know, to me, you know, personally, I'm done with that. I'm personally done with it. I think I, I, I'm with you. I want it to be memorable for me, not for yes, you know something that I can post. And it has correct. to be something that it, that that is that I experience for me on a deeper level, right? And I'm creating correct. memories for myself and my family, right? It's yes, not about yes, something definitely. that I want to share to strangers. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I believe that uh, I always think that whoever is going in this specific uh, aspect to, for example, hotels, is looking definitely for something that touches not only visually but also inside your your emotion. You can be in a very beautiful place, very very beautiful location, but then the service in your hotel is is not that great. You will you will remember that particular aspect instead of mm. uh, how well was designed the hotel. So it's a combination to me, it's a combination of uh, different aspects. And I'm so fortunate that working in hospitality, we can try to control as much as possible those with other consultants, of course, in the, in the project specifically, but it's extremely important to me. Is it a fair question to ask um, from an interior design perspective? with all the things that we've just talked about, are there specific types of materials and even designs, specific designs that you tend to gravitate towards right now that take all the boxes? There are specific materials. Usually uh, what uh, I'm always looking for is the location itself of specifically the project that we are working on and try to incorporate any specific material that I can find in the, directly in the location. So we, we bring back that very direct connection to the location. Sometimes is, if it's not possible to do that, probably I will use some material that evokes something that I can find directly in the place, which can be also a color tone. For example, I'm in a volcanic uh, area there is no volcanic stone to be <laughs> used, but maybe the dark, the dark gray, the, the color tone, I can feel that it can trigger that, that relation to, to the location. So that's something that usually I do with my work. You mentioned the word trends, and I'm curious to know, you know, each decade or each period of time is often known for a look right? Where, whether yeah. it's Art Deco, whether it's yeah. something very, like say in the 80s, it was very glass and steel and opulence, even to a certain extent. How would you define the era in which we are in right now? 
hmm. in it's terms of a trend, question. if you could even. I believe the, the trend right now is towards to bring that unexpected design or use of the material. So that gives, and also the use of the new technologies that allow you to, you know, to explore uh, maybe the same material, but in a different technique. But I don't like trends. That's definitely something that I, I can say because I look for something that our projects, possibly they will last for some time. So I always look for something that's more timeless. There are some references, definitely with other era, as you, as you mentioned. But nowadays, we have access to a lot of information. So we have the ability to you know, explore something that we never knew about it from the 90s, uh, the 80s, that probably we can bring back. But I believe it needs to be always something that stays in our real time. What have been some of the projects that you've worked on that remain in your mind, both from a challenge perspective, mm. but also from a perspective where you, where you were so inspired by what you ended up doing? Yeah, this uh, is come, going back to when I was working in Milan and started to work for this company. The owner were trained by Zaha Hadid, Rem Kolas, the UN studio. So there was a very strong, heavy background in a way. So I joined this company and I remember it was a great company because they were exploring the Korean, for example, the material, the, the solid surface as a main material, which at that time was quite something new. And we started to work with this fashion designer, which now is very famous, Philip Line. And I was working in his, one of his mansion. And that was the first time that I had to really create and follow his vision as a, as a client. To me, it was extremely challenging because it was a private residence. So it's something so private that you have to have that chemistry with the client and understand his lifestyle, whatever he likes. And the challenging part, it was, I don't know how many times we were selecting furniture. He was so obsessed with iconic design pieces. So we were looking at those very famous brand, high-end luxury items and and to me that opened up my thinking of how to really create that experience in a way it was a very personal experience but it gives me the foundation to understand what luxury means <laughs> which at the time but before probably i didn't i didn't experience and so on so yeah that was a really incredible an incredible opportunity for me i always tend to as I mentioned, to look at the emotional aspect of the design. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I believe that at the time it was something that really was started to be applied in a way. What did you learn about yourself? What I learned about myself is to be really comfortable and confident to make decisions. However, probably you are not really in line with that decision, but you try to understand and see things from other side of, of the things. So I learned a lot in terms of probably I was not really aligned with the taste, <laughs> design taste of, of the clients in, in that particular case. But uh, you always need to to find a way to you know to turn it in a, mm. in a positive and and on your on your side in, in that sense that's a really interesting point because what you do is very much about taste right it's very much about cultivating a look a feel a sense of belonging a sense of excitement inspiration memories all of that together and the person who's also bringing all of these ideas and materials together also has that you have this almost immediate connection. You understand what the what the the project is, what the client wants, right? But then there's also your own personal education and what informs yep. you, right? Yeah. So yep. how how do you how do you marry the two if indeed what the client wants it wants is very different to what you think actually works or 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 looks good. 
Yeah, actually, is uh, you you touch one very important point is the subjectivity of our <laughs> our work. I think it comes with experience, right? As much as you deal directly with the people that you you work with, you will understand that things are very subjective, and maybe uh, ten people they will not like it, but hundred people, perhaps they they will love it. I try always to create a balance. And I believe that if you design something that makes sense, it's, it goes above that of the just the taste of, of your of your design taste. Uh, I, I believe. So if you if you give a meaning of what are you doing, and you are strongly uh, you know strongly believe on that, and it ends up always on how you tell that story, right? Uh, I, I'm obsessed in my work, specifically when I do concept, when I create concept on the storytelling part, how you, you end up to think about that object or that design. And so to give even more meaning to it. So that's, I think, one of the things that I learned. That's such an important point that it has to make sense. And that yes. cuts through everything, doesn't it? It, ha- it? It's like a direct line through to the intention of the project in the first place and the purpose of yeah. it in, in the first place. Talk to me then about the kind of stories that you like to tell at WATG through your designs. Yeah, I'm always interested to, definitely I do a lot of research on uh, location, definitely. Uh, you know, we talk about sense of place and that's something that is always like a buzzword and we, we talk about design or specifically in you know, a hotel environment. The first thing that I, I look for is what will give me a sense of place, first of all, and the relation of potential design. But also at the same time, I like to bring some of my memories or something that I read about it or do some analogy. Like, for example, we were working on this project in China and I was reading a poem by Mary Oliver American poet, and she was describing the migration of geese. And so I created that analogy from the migration of the geese with the hotel guests. So they come to this place and what what are those feelings and try to translate that in a design. You know, if only people could see you right now. I know this is only audio because it's podcast, (laughs) but the look on your face, you just look so happy. And so excited when you talk about embarking on a project and uh, just getting stuck in with the research and creating a story out of a place. You look fired up and just completely inspired. It's all in your eyes. (laughs) It's really lovely to see. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I really, really, uh, you know, I've been many years already doing this and I really loved (laughs) <laughs> what what I do I, from where I started and you know this moment here this meeting it was also an opportunity for me to go back and try to, to draw a line of what what I'm doing and what uh, you know I ended up to do it uh, and if I can still have that energy to you know to bring to the table when I when I do design and I'm I'm really glad that you, I, I hear your feedback <laughs> saying, saying that <laughs> it's so you feel true. the same the same energy and the same happiness. In, I in really do. I do sense it. I feel it. I can see it in your eyes that there's this there's this there is this real genuine love for the work that you do. And after all this time, you've still got it, and that you it continues to keep you inspired. What brought you to design in the first place? All right. Uh, that's an interesting question because I I born in a very small village in the southern Italy. And this village has a Roman origins. So it's really beautiful. It's surrounded by heritage. And I believe that was the first memories of my thinking of architecture and history and, you know, those beautiful a beautiful thing. There was there is a this beautiful old castle that you see only on the fairy tales. But I had in my hometown. What was uh, so the village I called? Started, what was the village it's called? Venosa. Venosa. Okay. 
um, it's on the south. It's a small region called Basilicata. It's, I always joke with my friends or whoever doesn't know from where I am, saying I'm near Naples, uh, nearby Naples. So it's more kind of <laughs> internationally known. <laughs> But it's really, it's really pretty, and I uh, was happy to be to go there and 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 stay there for for some time. So uh, saying that, I always be surrounded by architecture, and which I think uh, gives me that curiosity to understand more and more and more. However, my my parents were running a totally different business. Uh, they own a restaurant, so they were more on the food <laughs> side as a typical Italian. <laughs> so that, it's something that they, they always expect to, to do it, right? And uh, apart from that, I've always been curious, always be interested to arts, exploring the different type of arts, not just uh, drawings or um, painting, but different. For example, I love movies. Our restaurant was just next to a theater. So I had opportunity to you know to have a friend that he brings me to the cinema to the cabin and always be interested there was this beautiful amazing tv show in italy very late night that was called english translation and uh, not only fashion so they were showing reportage about cinema about architecture about arts so i always been interested on that and i believe that However, my future was more towards maybe the restaurant business. Mm. But yeah, that was my first approach to, to everything about design. Yeah. What kind of a kid were you? I was very meticulous in a way that very, from the beginning, very detailed person <laughs> in a way. For example, I studied art school and I remember me spending weeks on drawings and going really close to the you know, we were doing a reproduction of, of uh, famous artworks and I was there spending my, my time. Internet was, wasn't there yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time drawings. I, I love to do portrait. I've been always interested to see things and, and kind of to reproduce on a paper or on, on anything close to that. I was kind of introverted. A kid in a way always happy always smiling but at the same time I wanted to be surrounded with the right person the, with mm -hmm. the right friends so I, I can always take something from whoever was with me well that's no wonder why you now are in a profession where being in close proximity to a space is very important because it, it's about that intimacy, it's about that experience and how it affects us, yeah. especially for someone who is an, an introvert or who was an introvert as a child. You know, we are looking at that space that we are in. I'm talking about yeah, how yeah. we feel is very important to us, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely it is. And, and, and actually, uh, also right now is something that is in my, my DNA is, is that uh, I always tend to observe a lot. <laughs> um, it's not just curiosity, but I believe that I always have this uh, in my mind, a library of images. I don't write any diary or uh, I, I don't take notes, but I have, I have always been, everything was more related to visual stuff, mm -hmm. visual images than writing. I'm curious, what kind of aesthetic do you go for, for yourself, for your own home? It sounds very weird. <laughs> <laughs> I but, love it. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with matte black finish, which is, you know, I always uh, also do in my work, I try to always create some contrast on things. It's almost like a blank canvas. And then you start to punch with the colors and strokes, right? And to me, my blank canvas is a black <laughs> matte finish mm -hmm. and where I started to put some contrast on it. And I don't like definitely anything is very polished, is very shiny. I tend to be very more kind of give a bit of calmness to, to the space, to the design that I usually do. 
I do like bold colors, but in a controlled way. Does not sound weird at all. <laughs> it actually sounds really, really nice and comforting. Who would you say was the biggest influence on you when you were growing up? Mm, okay, from the let's say from the professional uh, side or um, personal, both or personal, yeah. Uh, definitely, I, I think my, my parents and the, their business running a restaurant, I think it gives me an understanding how hospitality works in a way. And it's something that I project in my life outside the work. I really enjoy to invite people to my house, prepare a meal to, for them. Cooking is in my DNA. I cannot hide <laughs> that. But in terms of, I would say, lifestyle or my, my personal things, I think my parents, they did a great job in a way. They show me the hard work, what doesn't mean to, you know, being uh, very passionate about what are you doing. However, it was uh, different things. But now, I mean, when I started joining WTG, everything comes back to my drawing board. I can easily talk about SMB flows, how operation works, be very attentive on branding part of the, of the restaurant or whatever it is. And uh, professionally, I always admire, I already mentioned the, how the objects or, or the design needs to not always work in terms of functionality mm. and comfort, but also in your inner, inner feelings, right? And one of the main influences was when I was studying university, Ettore Sozzas is a very famous Italian designer. And he talked about sensorial empathy with objects, with spaces, which is not just visual connection to those, but is something that more into in the inner side of the users. That I think is something that I always have been clear in my mind and people that can interact with an object or in a space in a different ways. I really always look forward to apply to, to mm -hmm. my design. And definitely my experience in, I, I work in Milan, I work in, uh, in Spain, here in Singapore, uh, Milan is the capital of the design. I was surrounded by all friends, no matter how designers, architects, no matter how involved in something creative to bring, to, to work in. And when I moved to Spain, it was kind of a different experience because I was trying to understand more, kind of challenging me in a different environment. However, Spain is very close to Italy, so even languages are quite similar. But it was more... However, Milan is very international as a city, but being in a totally different culture and different things, it was like a good challenge for me. And then Singapore. Singapore is totally different <laughs> from Europe. However, it's, it's the place where... Uh, usually we talk in Asia about East, Mid, West, but in this Singapore is more West, Mid, East. So I feel kind of comfortable being here, which I found in some aspect very familiar to me. I love my team right now. We have like eight na different nationalities, only in a very no big team. We are less than 20, but having uh, been surrounded by different people, different cultures is, is quite inspiring as well. What do you still want to achieve? Well, professionally, I think, as, as I mentioned, it's, it's everything about your uh, experience, what you experience while you are doing your profession. And I believe that I would like to even more experiment a little bit more in my, my profession, perhaps I always challenge me with something that I'm not used to. So going out from my comfort zone and probably uh, perhaps it's working project that I never worked before. And even more collaborating with different people, it brings a different way of seeing the design. Uh, sustainability is something that uh, definitely is having this accreditation right now is, is bringing me to think on, on that aspect of the project. So it's something that I want to go and give more and more so it doesn't stay on, just on, on the paper, on a title. <laughs> <laughs> 
I hope you keep having that sense of excitement that you obviously have for the work that you do and the kind of experiences and challenges that you face. And I, I hope you continue to have that, that real, I don't know, just, just joy that you show for you. where you are right now. I want to do something right now, something fun. Um, I'm just sure. going to ask you some quick fire questions. Tell hmm. me about some jobs you've had in the past that don't have to be related to what you're doing now. It could be completely unrelated. Sure. I've been a librarian for the university library. So I, I was helping every student that came into the library to look for the, for the right books, the right uh, CD at the time, <laughs> the yeah. video and the <laughs> cassettes. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I remember that too. <laughs> um, and then I was working as a waiter for catering events. In I, I study architecture in Florence and... We were used to work on during the weekend in those beautiful old heritage building, gorgeous events, weddings. What did you grow up believing? Well, I did grow up believing. I think uh, it, this is a great question because my parents taught me that following your passion is what matters. And no matter how you, you try different things, uh, I think... If you are so lucky to, to work, <laughs> to do something that you are passionate about it, just go for it. That's my, I my belief. <laughs> I love that. What were you taught? Well, this is probably related to what you just answered, but it might be different. What were you taught was fundamental to a fulfilling life? Mm, I think one of the, the main, maybe if people that they know me very well, they see that I'm very honest. <laughs> I, I like honesty uh, in every level. It's just not personal level, but uh, if you do things with a with, uh, honest approach, I think it's that's definitely something that's fundamental. Your beverage of choice? Aperol Spritz. Ah, Spritz is a very nice. common drinks yes. uh, during the aperitivo time in Italy. Very and, refreshing, uh, I have to say. Very refreshing. Or no, yes. no, dangerously refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you will not, yeah, you will not notice <laughs> the, the level of <laughs> alcohol. <laughs> but yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. This one I'm curious about. Uh, favorite meal? Favorite meal? Mm, well, you know, it's a it's a very difficult question because I love I love pasta. Mm. <laughs> uh, I have a very good memory of how traditionally my mom was preparing, for example, lasagne. That's pro probably the the yeah the the most comfort mm. comfort food. Sounds sounds yeah. not, not nice, but yeah. It's, no, it's... are you kidding? I'm all about the comfort food. <laughs> I could be at the most expensive restaurant that's all about you know nouveau cuisine but it has to, for me i i will choose comfort food any day yeah that's what's important to me what feeling are you searching for most when you're working hmm you know i i want to always be i don't want to say uh, i like being in a calm environment i like the energy Mm. So I want to feel that energy while I'm working, even if it's just a small, small team. But I think that's the right thing, the energy. Yeah. And finally, if you were writing an autobiography, what mm. would the title be? Hmm. Wow. All right. Maybe I copy one of the most that I really like as a quote is... Um, is uh, Diana uh, Vreeland. Mm -hmm. And she said, the eye has to travel. So I think that's, yeah, I will copy that. <laughs> I love that. That's a really good one because it says so much about you and all that you've done and do and still want to continue yeah. doing. Paola, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Monita. Thank you so much for, for having for having me to doing this and for your time. I was quite nervous. <laughs>
definitely you are so great to make me feel comfortable. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. That was Paolo De Simone joining me from Singapore. You've been listening to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast. I'm Onida Rajpal. Thank you for joining us.